Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for hanging out or showing up if you uh, just got here. Um, for those of you that were in the room at the end of uh, the temporary distortion presentation uh, and conversation, we're going to continue to discuss uh, AI and performance um, with the artists here on stage. And sorry, I need my glasses nowadays. Um, so where I'd like to begin um, by way of allowing people to sort of introduce themselves is um, not only just introducing their work and what they do and who they are. Um, I'm sure that most of you know uh, a lot of the people up here, um, but also talking about what first led uh, the artist to, to introducing AI into their work um, and a little bit about what that project was, uh, what year it was created. Um, some of us on here, this stage have been doing this uh, much longer than than me, for example. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so I just kind of figured we start there. And then uh, I have a few questions, but I also wanted to open up to this maybe like a little bit differently um, than common because I'd like to open it up for people that are on the panel to moderate this as much as I'm moderating it, right? Because I feel like there's a lot of expertise in the room. And, uh, and I'm sure that there are incredible questions that each artist up here has to pose to both themselves and the others. Um, so if we could kind of spread it around that way and then hopefully at, at the end have some time for uh, questions from the audience, yeah? Um, so why don't we just go across uh, and we'll start next to me. And Hi, we'll... is this supposed to be on? Yeah. Hi, uh, I'm Marianne Weems. I'm the artistic director of the Builders Association, a cross-media performance company that's been around forever by which I mean 1994. Um, and yeah, we've done a lot of projects, you know, using various kinds of technology, mostly to kind of talk about technology and how it is framed in terms of labor and um, transactional, you know, um, aspects of our culture. And that doesn't sound very interesting, did it? That's so boring. So for instance, we did a show recently about uh, micro workers and online labor, the MicroTurk community that serves Amazon. And um, we worked with them for a couple of years. So that's part of our process is it's extremely labor intensive. And um, they created a project with us, a performance, an online show where um, it was kind of a second screen event where you as the viewer were had to perform tasks based on what the micro workers assigned you. And so it was like a, you know, you were scored and paid, paid in builders bucks. Um, and I can't even remember, but okay, let me just quickly say, so one, the next show that we're working on um, is going to launch election year. It's an election year show, and it's about a post-truth candidate that we're creating with AI, embodied by Mo Angelos, who's in the audience tonight. And um, so a lot of what we're working on now is kind of um, how that's going to be generated, that specific candidate. So I might leave it there for now. Awesome. Hi, I'm Andrew Scoville. I'm a director and a creator of original work. A lot of my work is around bringing science concepts into theater. That's some of my more recent stuff. But in 2013 and in 2015, I worked with a um, robot called Bina 48. And Bina 48 is essentially a bust, uh, an animatronic bust, and it mixed with a chat bot. And so with some collaborators up here who are here, Dave Tennant and Lynn Rosenberg, we made two projects. Um, where Bina was essentially an actor in the show, interacting with um, other yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Thank you. So Bina 48 is essentially um, a chatbot with a bus animatronic and, and it was interacting with other actors in the show. Uh, we didn't at that time set out to with the intention of working with AI, we were mostly exploring content. It was one of those situations where you're making a piece that you think is in science fiction, and then you stumble upon something that is sort of a proof of concept of this idea that you thought was not real. And so we stumbled upon Bina 48 as sort of a research project. And the more we got to know Bina, and the more we got to know Bina's handler, Bruce, Bina became part of the project. And we incorporated um, Bina into uh, a couple pieces as an actor. 
Hi, I'm Annie. Um, I made uh, my first piece using um, a kind of uh, very rudimentary, old fashioned form of natural language programming uh, kind of AI uh, in 2009. Um, that piece um, did not use big data or statistical analysis. It was an old fashioned uh, AI that was, um, let's say, sort of pre the statistical turn in the development of generative AI. Um, I just made a piece that is my response to generative AI. Um, and, you know, we can talk about that if you're interested, but I guess what I'm mostly wanting to propose after almost 15 years of working with these things is that working with AI is um, a political, that there's a political dimension to use of these tools. It's not at all neutral. Uh, and it's not at all really like previous sort of technological um, products that have been introduced at various times. Um, and I'll, I'll be happy to say more about that. And I also would mention that I'm also in law school right now, um, and I've been studying uh, tech policy. So I'm also happy if people have questions about some of the lawsuits that artists are bringing against the tech companies. Um, and I can talk about this on both the input side, the training on works, and also on the output side and the status of the AI generated material. We, we just talked a lot. So Sully's part of temporary distortion. So, um, but some people just walked in the room. Um, so we'll just keep it short. We're, we just showed some work in progress. It's our first piece working with AI. So we don't really have the history um, that I feel like m most people here have. Um, but it's what made me curious about sort of putting this panel together and asking these questions and, and starting this kind of conversation um, in a venue like Prelude. Um, so I guess one of the questions that I have off the bat is um, if there's anything that the integration of AI into your work um, has allowed you to do that you wouldn't be able to do otherwise, or is that not true? So, Well, it's definitely allowing us to play with um, live text generation, specifically working with this candidate, because we, we want to try to make... Um, a model that could be electable. This is our idea of this post-truth candidate. So, but we're using Ayn Rand's work as the point of departure. So it's a tough sell, um, but not impossible if you kind of tweak it with a little Dolly Parton, little Roald Dahl, you know, so the, uh, the whole idea of like generating it in real time and finding how that voice could be, um, you know. Sounds like a jam. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. So that's something that we couldn't do. And we're very much like depending on the tool. Yeah, I feel like. Um, is this on? Yeah. OK, I feel like uh, it, it what it allowed us to do in the in the particular pieces that we used was just to give people a chance to observe that kind of AI that's sort of like embodied or attempting to. Uh, mimic human expression and 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 hold a conversation with another person to just to create a different sense of awe that I feel like we're always looking to do in theater, create this sense of wonder. And there was something about Bina's presence in the room that uh, does that automatically. How long that lasts is a is a question. It's a good question. But and that I feel like is determined by the actors who are on stage with Bina, your interest in actually staying with it. Um, but there is a there is a sort of there felt like a shortcut to this new sense of awe at that time. That was really exciting. You know, all my work is really about um, investigating uh, these technologies, natural language programming, what computer generated text does, how it functions. Um, uh, some of the Eliza effect stuff that you're talking about. Um, and uh, so all my works would not have been made unless the technology was something that I wanted to be looking at yeah and i would just add for me i'm kind of a analog advocate uh so i like to juxtapose the new technologies that comes in because it kind of shines the uniqueness of the magic moment of um uh, analog had its peak in history and then it was replaced by digital so something about that i think is like a human story too through our machines um, so 
no, I probably wouldn't be able to do the work if I didn't have whatever the next thing that comes down the road. So that's what I find really interesting about it. Um, I'm curious uh, from Annie. Uh, so Andrew mentioned this sense of awe and wonder. Um, and I read I read the piece that you wrote recently um, about AI. Um, and so I'm for those of you that haven't read it, um, I wonder if you could speak a little bit about it. And also, um, so my short version would be that you're kind of stepping back a little bit, or is the sense that I got from reading that, or is, is that a false impression? I mean, I've only made the one piece with generative AI and I would not do it again. Okay. And I only made that piece in order to criticize generative AI. So I'm not stepping back from algorithmic work or, uh, you know, but I am um, like uh, uh, strongly um, advocating that people think very hard about what they want to do with this tool and how they want to use it and what the meaning of using it is. Um, so in that uh, essay, uh, would you want me to talk about the Eliza effect or the, or the, the I'm happy to let you talk about whatever you'd like. <laughs> um, but uh, I think that, about it, that or it, would, about why? it would be nice maybe for people to have a little bit of a kernel of what that okay. essay was about. Okay. And then maybe that could bleed into us asking questions okay. of one another. I will try to be super succinct. Okay. Um, so the um, basic thesis of that piece, which doesn't really have a thesis, it was more of a thinking through kind of text, but um, okay. uh, in American theater. Oh, okay. uh, yeah, no one saw it. I mean, yeah. um, but uh, is that, um, you know, that artists have a um, are playing a very precise role in the dissemination of these tools. Um, and that role that we are being asked to play is something like being a propagandist um, for the tech companies to make these tools seem cool, sexy, interesting, available to everyone, democratic. They're, we're going to make these beautiful things in MoMA that look like screensavers. And we're going to, you know, oh. we're going to um, make these cool, huh? Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm not the first to, but uh, you know, we're gonna make these like I can you know read it all day, but the we're make these like funny things where we say, oh, you know, ChatGPT, write me a funny scene, and then somehow it's novel and interesting just because ChatGPT wrote it, um, or the special voice that these uh, the text seems to have um, that is uh, something like a default style or something. Um, is charming because it's kind of dumb or it's kind of banal. It's, you know, there's a lot of things we're doing with these tools that are thoughtless. Um, and there's a writer that I recommend to people, uh, his name, well, I'm, I could give you a syllabus, but I'll just say Dan McQuillan is the writer who wrote a book on resisting AI. Um, and he was the first one to make me think about this question of thoughtlessness, um, that using generative AI uh, allows us to skip all the hard work and just get some results. And then we also don't have responsibility for those results because it was made by the AI. So that's been the case with algorithmic decision systems, which are used in many different social contexts. That's been a problem that a lot of AI critics have been pointing out for many years. Uh, and I'm talking about the ways that AI gets used to make, um, determinations uh, for various public services, for various government functions, incarceration, recidivism rates, um, some educational uh, um, uses as well, the administration of public benefits. You know, it's these tools are getting embedded in all kinds of places in our society. And when government agencies or private companies use them, they get to say, Oh, well, we don't know. I mean, it's just what the thing said, because the statistics are so complicated. How could we possibly know why it's making that determination? Therefore, we disavow uh, the responsibility for having made the decision. When you start looking at how these tools are trained and how they're deployed, you find all kinds of um, what the AI researcher Kate Crawford calls like uh, a parade of horrors, really, in the training data. Um, so the notion that they're value neutral in some way uh, because they've been run, because the, the information has been run through a high level, complicated, you don't wanna know, it's too complicated for our small brains. You know, These systems allows us to get results without having done any work for it. And also without having any responsibility for the harms that those results might cause. 
um, has led me to, I mean, that's just, this is like one corner of my problem with generative AI, uh, but it's a pretty important corner. Um, so in that piece, I basically say, so we know the harms are happening in terms of algorithmic bias. We know they're happening in terms of incarceration, in terms of uh, military. I, I'm not sure I mentioned the military, but that one too. In terms of all kinds of pretty important things going on uh, that are being um, delegated to these tools without very much oversight. These are private companies. They don't have to show their work. Uh, there's an incredible lack of transparency about what goes into the tools and how they function and what the competence level is, even of the companies in the results that they give. So given all that in the piece, I say, you might think who cares about artists in this because it's all just fun. But I think what artists are doing is super important because we are the ones making it seem cool and making it seem interesting and fun and making it seem like all you other people, like, don't be afraid. Or what did, what did somebody already said something about, oh, uh, Frank did about being comfortable. Yeah, we're making people very comfortable with these things. Um, and I hope that we are uh, on guard against getting too comfortable. That's my spiel. Avant-garde, avant hopefully. Huh? Avant-garde, hopefully. Oh, uh, on guard. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I know you're dying to ask a question. <laughs> okay, I don't want to stop you from seeing your ass. Uh, the problem also possibly, uh, I don't know anything, but could the all problem also possibly lean less on like how the technology is made and more on the inhumanity of the institutions that it's like revealing yeah, as all that as inhuman, all that. And, and, you know, the, the short story writer, Ted Chang has talked about uh, these tools as being a kind of new form of McKinsey. I don't know if that means anything. Um, yeah, uh, um, the well, the the company yeah. that um, advises corporations on how to streamline, streamline, make more efficient their operations, which usually means cutting labor force, weakening unions, um, going for cheaper labor elsewhere, lots of arbitrage. You know, like there's there's a way in which the basic tool that we're the the, the basic function so far that everyone can agree is an actual use case for these tools is to eliminate jobs and weaken bargaining power on the part of workers, uh, even by the threat of using these tools. So that's why the WGA strike was so exciting because they really stuck to their guns and they really pushed back and they got an enormously, um, I don't know, encouraging contract, let's say that uh, we're not just at the mercy of these things and it's all inevitable and there's nothing we can do. So yes, I think you're right. The institutions, the corporate structures that are dealing with them, like all the money that these companies are making is not from users, it's from enterprise contracts. So the only way they're ever gonna make money back for their venture capital investors is by selling contracts to embed these systems in other companies. So anyway, sorry, I'm going, this is uh, totally derailing the whole. No, no, it was a question. It was a question from the audience. Is that uh, at all relevant to your question? Great, because there wasn't a question already with the answer. Like I was reading, oh, I was yeah. wondering if you were like, no, no, no. <laughs> but you, you gave like a paradox. It was like, it's making us lose jobs, but also like those jobs were killing those people anyway. Um, yeah, I mean, one, another, I can't remember who said this. Mm, could have been David Gerard. Not sure, uh, uh, or David Columbia, but um, that like uh, generative AI isn't actually going to eliminate all our jobs. It's going to eliminate some of them, and the rest it's going to make much more alienated. So, yeah, it's super. I mean, it's it's not a pretty thing what's happening here. Um, and uh, anyway, so I think it's interesting to think about the role that artists play. In all that. Is there a question you'd like to pose to someone else on the panel, the rest of the panel? No. Okay, I'll pose something. Okay, so, I mean, yeah, we could talk about AI in the larger sphere for five days, but I think we let's talk about theater because that might be sort of what we're supposed to be doing. Sure. So, I, to me, one of the interesting things that you did in your prod in your latest piece that I thought was very effective was you know how in Halloween masks, like 
if you're wearing half a mask, it's much more terrifying than if you see the whole face or you see the whole mask. So that that moment, right, that gray area where it's like there's still a person there and there's this like friction around you and the AI and you get to see both in dialogue with each other like that being able to stage that I thought was really great. Congratulations. And so do you know what I mean that I think <laughs> that there's a lot going on um, and it's not like AI is totally winning at this point, at least in this, uh, you know, little corner of the world. So, yeah. Well, Would you like to push back well, already? I was going to say that um, I was I was going to add to the the very real problems that are coming up that it's interesting to think about. Um, I wouldn't this panel seems like a already um, something that is pushing back on what seems to be the thoughtless aspect is people saying it's value neutral yeah. or perhaps that it's generative actually, because what's interesting about the work I know of, of the, the five of you actually, um, but then also what you know you're you're explicitly talking about in in everything that you were talking about making is that you're actually pointing you seem to be pointing out how artists point out that this is a very human <laughs> tool and that there is the human thing behind it so i'm absolutely terrified of the embedding of ai in a completely unregulated you know only through the uh interest of a private corporation that's perhaps dehumanized or something. However, it's like the art with AI and what I just saw with your work, uh, Kenneth and Sully, like um, actually shows, points out that this isn't uh, without an author. Um, I, I actually didn't, I don't really see that, you know, you, even you saying this image was created by AI. I just don't see it that way. I mean, it's edited. It's 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 it was prompted. It was you know whatever. So I understand you know the AI aspect is something, but in fact, you artists seem to be pointing out to us how uh, you know that there is a face and a and a and a thinking, uh, you know, non algorithmic thinking uh being behind it so anyway that that i you know i'm not that's not really pushing back i just wanted to add that i think your art seems to be yeah that's what i mean by it's serving different. a little bit as propaganda absolutely right yeah. so well but just not necessarily making us comfortable that's all i mean i i don't see it that way even the moma stuff it's like well that's just a bad that's just a bad piece of art perhaps it doesn't necessarily make me comfortable or me think that AI is cool necessarily. I mean, that sounds like I'm pushing back on you, but I'm just saying it could be used that way, but I don't think y'all are talking about using it that way. So, uh, yeah. yeah. Perhaps. But maybe we're missing each other. Yeah. I was very comfortable. In fact, I was very comfortable until I failed the Turing test or I won the Turing test with your piece when I thought like, oh no, this is a human. This is a two guys. They're brilliant. It's the second time for me that the Turing test has been failed. It happened in March at the Whitney with the cashier. I bought a little pin and it was this um, Nazi chat bot that they had resurrected. Did anyone see this? <laughs> it was something that happened like a few years back and they had this chat bot, but they fed it through the whole internet. So it became fascist. And so Microsoft had to cut it. I don't remember, it was a female name. I don't remember, but they had resurrected it, these artists. And then I talked to the cashier and I was like, she was like, yeah, it's so crazy. And I'm like, yeah, right. She's like, yeah, I wouldn't even know if you were a robot. Oh, <laughs> break my heart. <laughs> so I'm uncomfortable, you know, even though you're very optimistic, it's not like denial for me. You're a little bit more optimistic than me. I don't know. I don't know Peter at all. Well, I, I agree 100% with everything she's saying. Um, but I'm trying in my, like I said, and as, I'm going to be 60 years old. I'm trying to stand next to it so you can see me as the artist, even if it's all going down in flames. So that's my optimism, is that I'm going to be an artist all the way to the end. So you can watch me as you're choosing AI. You can watch me go down and you can choose the AI. It's up to the audience. That's my optimism. That I'm optimistic 
because I'm going to stand up as the artist. That's my optimism. So that's why I said I have to juxtapose it. You got to put good next to evil. Yeah, it's evil. No, evil. you have to put good next to evil. Uh, I I had a I had a question actually for the whole panel. Um, I think like a lot of your points are really quite and your projects are really quite interesting. Um, but I'm also noticing they come a lot from like prior knowledge from like not only the system but the thought that surrounds like working with these tools. I wonder like especially now that AI is becoming something that many artists are being asked to engage with at least in various levels of their process like if you could give uh if you could if you could put together like three questions that an artist should ask when thinking about or being asked to like speak about AI uh in a in some sort of context whether that's like at the bar or in a uh in a in a uh in a contract or in a in a contract or in a um uh in a sort of a new uh, pitch proposal piece and that's for the whole panel so like ethical questions three ethical questions i actually don't think it's necessarily only ethical i think it also could be aesthetic or um uh practical or philosophical thank thank you well, well no one well just one, one thing that I, I i don't this is formulating a question but just one thing that i'm noticing is there's uh sometimes the sometimes the ai is uh mysterious in its role in the piece um for example what we just watched do we what do we know what part of it is what part of it is ai are we as an audience intended to know and be able to distinguish is a question that i have because in in my example there was no question you know who the ai was and who the real person was it was in your piece i saw there was no question who the human up there was and what the role of the AI was. And so one question that comes to my mind is, um, will it be clear or what's the distinction? What's the audience's experience of, of the thing? Supposed. Supposed to be ideally. I have thought, I mean, I think it's an excellent question. And I, I guess I would want to know more what's what um, and my law brain kind of flipped on. Um, and so uh, in terms of um contracts uh i would anything that we do work for hire um or do in relation to the internet in any sense these days um you've got to ask if the material is going to be licensed to third parties um and whether you can opt out of that and get that in writing um licensing to third parties means it's going to be used for training data if you do any recording of your own voice, any biometric information, photographs of your face, anything that is biological information about you, um, that is a big red flag. Um, and then I also have some um, copyright advice, but maybe I'll just start a legal clinic. <laughs> I was actually more interested. But we can talk after if you have other questions about that, but I'm happy to look over your contracts. But I can't give legal advice because I am not a lawyer yet. I see where this is going. <laughs> Hi, thank you for putting together this panel. I'm Saviana Stanescu. I'm a playwright. And actually, I just completed two productions with AI characters that I wrote. But while I did the research with generative AI, ChatGPT, and all that, I wrote the characters myself, the lines. So I kind of outsource uh, the AI only like the research. And then I created the, the character, the dramatic journeys, everything. Zebra 2.0 was presented in the Ice Factory Festival. And Emotion is a dance theater piece that was uh, at Cherry Arts and is going to come to New York. But what I like to ask is, though, in my experience, one piece is a dystopia. The AI revol rebels against the creator, the neuro scientist. The other one is an utopian version. The AI and the uh, human get along very well. So I put both things out there. But isn't there, uh, in a way, these AI are just like another medium in the 
conversation that's uh, theater and the arts, uh, couldn't we, instead of, you know, sort of resisting it or questioning it so much, to just use it as a tool for us humans, the creators, and then um, maybe, you know, just treat it as just another medium in a multimedia performance. I personally don't see it as such a, a scary um, a tool, although I wrote a dystopian version of it, but more of a, okay, the AI can be a character, a my character that I write, it can be an actor, it can be a designer. We work with the AI as we work with any other human or any other entity. And maybe this is the future, that we learn to work with this kind with different entities that are not humans, right? So why not? So my question is, do you see any utopian version of this collaboration with the AI? Thank you. I, I kind of guess we might know Annie's answer. So <laughs> totally, I'm totally talking way too much. And I really apologize. I just want to I just want to say that the one of the interesting uh, and a little dystopian maybe things about um, the big uh, AI companies uh, and a lot of the big Silicon Valley companies is that they're run by people who actually do see this choice between dystopia utopia. They, um, I don't know if you guys have heard of the sort of test creel or effective altruism, long-termism. These are all- Sam Friedman sort of, Banks, is that, huh? is that who you mean? Who? Sam Friedman Banks. Uh, one, he's one, but it, he doesn't do AI, he does crypto, but he, that hasn't worked out very well for him. Um, but uh, but yeah, he's an effective altruist, right? Um, but there's a, an enormous weird ideological component to this, um, which I would recommend everyone just Google, you know, uh, it and, or duck, duck, go it really. And, uh, um, you know, check it out because there is, uh, I agree with you completely the most likely scenario is neither utopia nor dystopia. It's that we um, have this new thing, which has been more or less imposed on us. We learn to live with it, but it makes everything kind of shittier. And so, you know, we can learn to live with things being shittier. Things have gotten shittier. We've been dealing with it, but we could also like decide we don't want life to get shittier. And so in that sense, like, it's not a question of, necessarily dystopia, but it's a question of saying, no, nah, we don't actually, that's a road we don't, like that doesn't lead to anything great for yeah. us. That's like, to me, that's such a key moment is this, um, we're on the road, you know, they call it acceleration risk in Silicon Valley, which is like, we don't know what's going to happen, but we got to get there first. China's coming right after us. You know, like the, the it's the, you know, break, th move fast and break things is there right so that is how these things come into being without our being able to regulate and then by the time you know we're like what the fuck uh, congress is throws up their hands and says well it's all it's in the system and we're all using it all the time so i feel like we're at that moment um and that artists do have a chance to like put a little pin in the sand draw a tiny line in the sand and say like in this moment you know pre-regulation just point to it because in another whatever couple months a couple <laughs> years you won't be able to point to it so that part of it to me is the like the, the dystopian part wins because it's you know infiltrating all of our it's going to be like electricity or the steam engine or anything like that except evil <laughs> exactly <laughs> What do you think? I, oh, no, please, please. No, 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 go ahead. I, I just, the thing that comes to mind for me is like the theater of it, you know, the, the utopia is somewhere in the, um, the collaboration that theater requires everybody showing up. Even if you've made it in a dark room by yourself, everyone showing up to witness it together, people continuing to come together. Um, that to me is is meaningful and also like just the idea that there's collaborators here who worked on those projects with robots and and our bond from that collaboration is the thing that is lasting it's not actually the collaboration with the robot that was meaningful but also expensive and like needed its own plane seat and like what are we doing you know what are we paying for but but it's you know i wouldn't have done the second piece with bina if we didn't get along so well with bruce and bruce is like the human person in charge of that robot and so there's something relational that theater requires that i think i see some light or some some version of 
utopia as these tools go. So I'm like the isolation part of it, the, the things that are left are in isolation. It's like, we're the, we're the, we're the part that has to persevere and like bring together, you know? Is, is there a question that you'd like to pose to me? The yeah. I am curious because in my situation, I was dealing with a thing that was already a character and we were sort of like trying to put uh like bench like a fence around and be like what is this thing capable of how is it theatrical so i'm just curious particularly some folks creating characters using ai as opposed to kind of inheriting a character that i had to deal with and, and figure out a context for so i'm curious about the um how ai is used to create care original characters new characters i'm gonna say I mean, I'm going to say more Please pain do. in the ass things, but yeah. Um, yeah, I would say that the anything that ChatGPT created in Prometheus is totally uninteresting to me. It was there as an example. And uh, prompting, I think, is not interesting. I don't think it's an art form. I don't think it's even really a skill. I think they're trying to convince us it is partly because they're challenging the Copyright Office's guidance on outputs. <laughs> and I'm serious. The So the Copyright Office has issued guidance that any output of a generative AI is public domain. It can't be copyrighted because it wasn't made by a person. The tech companies obviously would rather that not be the case because they want to be able to sell their products to movie studios and have movie studios make stuff with AI that they own, right? Uh, and so one of the things that they've been wanting, they've been doing in terms of their marketing and their hype is really pumping up the discussion of prompting as an art form that you can get better at, you can get skill in. We're going to have new jobs called prompt engineers. Oh. And I believe, yeah, it already, I mean, this is already happening. Sorry, this is happening, 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 <laughs> happening. Yeah, right. So, so. The new thing is, right, instead of a bunch of artists working in a studio, you know, drawing the backgrounds, uh, you're going to have two people, three people prompting the AI to do the backgrounds. So that's partly what the labor issues are about. The other part of it is convincing us that prompting is a part of your creative process. You know, I want to push back on that. I've played with these things for six years, I think, when they were first being developed. Um, I still can't really tell you what happens with, uh, you know, mid journey if I use this word versus that word. If I change, you know, this phrasing for my prompt or use some other phrasing. Yeah, if you tell it that you want a picture of a banana, it's going to give you a banana, right? Is that art? Don't know. It, you know, I call it like Warhol said yes. Yeah, Warhol said yes. <laughs> right. And <laughs> exactly. And if you nail it to the wall, but you know, I consider it like playing the slots. You put a little nickel in, that's your prompt. You see what you get. And then if you want to, you don't like the output. So you change a word and then you pull the lever again and you see what you get now. But the relationship between your prompt and your output is completely obscure. Uh, and, you know, anyway, I have, uh, more obviously to say about this. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I think about this basically seven hours, eight hours a day. So yeah, that's what I want to say is that that's why prompt engineering is becoming a thing is because they're going to push back on um, on copyrightability. Sorry, is that any AI or is that only AI that's, that is trained on large data sets? If you train your model on your own data set, how can that possibly be Oh, yeah, this is an open question. This hasn't been decided yet. Um, if you cr if you write your own model and train it yourself and you've written the code, you own the copyright in the code for sure. Um, the training data is another whole copyright issue, which is a real quagmire. Uh, you know, so this has been the hypothetical that, you know, you use only your own work to train a model that you have written yourself. You own the software, you own the training data. Can you copyright the output? We don't know, the Copyright Office hasn't said, and there hasn't been a court case to decide that. So that's what they call an unresolved issue. But, you know, that's where the tech companies are gonna start putting pressure on those open questions to try to get favorable rulings and start eating away at the guidance that none of the outputs are copyrightable 
And this is how you shift the law is you do test cases where you push on all the little weak spots and all the little hypotheticals uh, until you've made the original guidance kind of look like Swiss cheese. Um, it's unclear how much human intervention post-generation is required before it becomes something that can be copyrighted. Uh, you know, if you take an output from Dolly and you completely change it in all kinds of ways, but we don't know yet. So these are all the kind of live issues, but I'm pretty sure that's why prompt engineering is. That's what I wanted to say. Mary, drifting back uh, to the question about Andrew's question about original characters versus Lord. Did you did you want to dodge it or <laughs> I don't know. Mo, do you have anything to say as the character? <laughs> well, it's funny because it's kind of reverse engineering in a way, because I'm the human, but I'm I'm saying AI's text, right? And then I have, well, at this stage of the game, anyway, there's some kind of um, neural net. Yeah, well, there's a crazy neural net that I'm wearing on my head, which is hilarious. Um, but um, the idea is that it's, you know, trying to pump this stuff into my brain and then I am spitting it out, right? And I have a video uh, mask, I guess, right? So uh, it's, it's, you know, I keep as as the actor, as the human, I'm like, I don't want to say this shit. Why am I saying this stuff? You know, so like I'm just thinking a lot about well, what is my part in it? How do I resist this thing? Uh, so it and and, you know, and, you know, Annie, I saw your show and the the it will generate stuff. Right. It just makes words. Then what's the next word? What's the next word? What's the next word? But they're not that interesting. That's the thing. It's it's dull. It's kind of like it's kind of like the idea. It's the idea, but it, it it's with no um, zero humanity behind it. I guess so. Right. Meaning sure. is incidental. What the meaning is incidental. Yeah. It well it doesn't understand meaning. I mean, it it it, it has. It's not understanding anything. It's not understanding anything. So, but um, so here's one. So that's a great example just of character is that, you know, there's this little delicious moment when you see Mo not saying what it's telling her to say and she breaks out for a second. You know, that's the half the Halloween mask. So I think like staging that is very delightful because you keep looking for the human to like peep out for a second. Um, and it's that like the duet between the, or the tension there that I think is worth, you know, staging as a character. I get it. Oh, okay, go ahead. Go ahead, Stephen. Well, maybe my my question follows on very nicely from that, because um, we've been thinking about the uses of AI for people making theatre and doing theatre, but what about for the spectators? And I'm wondering what are the consequences of AI for spectatorship? Um, at the moment, I'm at a point which, uh, once I've realised something is AI generated, my brain switches off. That's it. It just it, oh clock. That's it. Next, I don't have a next set. The next level of questions feelings, ideas that come from that. It's purely registration and then and then go on. So I'm wondering um, how each of you are thinking about spectatorship and and what, you know, what's good, you know, because there's the there's the borderline, you know, moment where, which you're describing very nicely of going in and out. But there's also moments when you can't tell that. And then it's just, you know, the deflation or the explanation of, for you afterwards re retroactively. This is why this was quite dull. Uh, oh, now I know. Next. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm wittering now. I'll hand back. Well, I, I mean, I think what we're going to, what we're doing in this show is we're also um, trying to deploy a lot of swarming technology so that the audience can, you know, essentially kind of affect which way the performance is going. So they can, um, you know, hopefully they can kind of steer it in and out of being Mo or Ayn Rand, you know, like the idea is for them to be able to also have some agency in it, which is compl complex in a larger, you know, in a, with a big audience, who knows, jury's out. But that's one idea that at least doesn't put you in that passive position, which I think is ethically one of the issues. It's like when you are, yeah, it, when you have no idea and you have no tools to know, then why should you care? It, um, I think about, uh, 
you know, the, the most, when uh, the second piece we made, made was called an evening with being a 48 and it was Lynn at a restaurant, at a table, at a blind, like in a restaurant at the frying pan at a, and people were watching her have a blind date with this robot. And Lynn was the most interesting part. You quickly, you're like, oh, this thing's like, ah. and like, it's interesting. You're like, and sometimes you're like, what did they just say? You know, and it's, it's like so nonsensical that your human sense making brain is like, oh, that's interesting, I guess. But watching Lynn um, deal with it and have to improvise and keep, keep it going was, was what was like the hook, right? So that's, I guess, why it came to my mind, the question of like, how, what can we tell? Can we tell if it is or not? Because to me, if you can tell what is and is not, you can hook into the thing that is not and still find like a lot of value in the, in the performance. Something so I just wanted to bring it real quick because this that what this reminds me of in a strange way, and I can be completely wrong, or it might just be relative to my experience. Um, I'm a musician. I put years of my life into learning how to play instruments and put bands together and go up on stage and play and go into recording studios and multi-track and mix it all together. Uh, and then a guy named Ray Kurzweil, if anyone knows who he is, uh, who is the he's leading research at Google now. Uh, created a book called uh, Age of Spiritual Machines. Uh, he created a thing called a sampler. And overnight, the music industry flipped upside down. And all these great records that I loved and I listened to, I'm a funketeer, George Clinton, James Brown, all this great music, instantly was recycled and created hip hop. And now all these musicians and all these artists and all these producers, all these art forms that it takes to make a George Clinton record, now it could just be with one button on a keyboard and you just take a few seconds of it and now you go make hit records and you're left in the dust. So that happened, but no one's sitting there going, a freaking hip hop. You know what I mean? It's like hip hop happened. So, but I, I get the same feeling a little bit of like what I'm, what I'm here. It's, it's more of a feeling thing, not, not so intellectualized, but as, as the conversation keeps going on, that's kind of what it seems like. Well, I think the thing I just keep want to say, <laughs> Naomi Klein wrote this brilliant piece about this, which is that essentially what's what's happening is that Google and Microsoft and uh, are are walling off that information to make it proprietary and to sell it back to you. But the information is scraped from things that you made, things that we all wrote and made, right? And faces and tweets and et cetera, et cetera. So that's the part that I that sticks so badly is that it's being proprietized. That not a, you yeah, know, a not a of, unique point, but it's like it's that's a part of, of uh, enclosure. Yeah. You know, I mean, again, uh, there was a moment that you're describing when sampling started to become popular and people really weren't sure what it would mean for the original musicians. Um, these days, I dare you try using a sample and not crediting or paying the person who said right well used, but right? It, this but, has been but it shifted underneath you so what they did now is they created DAWs which are digital audio workstations that have all the samples in the DAW mm -hmm. which doesn't go back to the musician they're all in there buy a DAW set it up use it and it's all in there yeah and I don't mean to say that that's the they got that's they, the only difference yes, I, yes. I mean that yes there was a moment of um uncertainty yeah and it resolved itself to the benefit mostly of the big record companies yes. and big labels. Yes. So, you know, it's true that we love sampling, like that we don't have a problem with sampling, no. but one of the things that has happened over many years uh, is that more and more power has accrued to these giant corporate interests yeah, yeah, I, and I less and less power has been held by the artists yes. and the creators. Yeah. So I wouldn't, you know, I think maybe your story actually kind of tells, has the opposite moral uh, than maybe what you intended. It's like, yes, we're in a similar situation now where we're not sure how this technology is going to be incorporated into our lives, what it's going to mean for all of us, what it means for artists, what it means for the culture. And if history is a guide, you know, we, probably should not be fully embracing it without doing some careful thinking about how we want to use it, if at all. Um, yeah, so that's that's all I wanted to and say, I, is that no, there's I, another way of thinking about that anecdote. Yeah, well, you know? maybe you, and also you might have read me wrong. No, I think it is shittier. I actually think it was yeah. better. I'm Like I said, I'm an analog advocate, 
Uh, and I think now they'll just find another way to flip it. Like once they did legalize it and finally George Clinton finally got all his money when he was old and, and then it was over and then he basically retired. Uh, but then they figured out another way to do it. Once Spotify removed the power of the musician anyway, which in a way is kind of an AI. Um, and then obviously the digital audio workstations is full of, by, if you go into music programs with that running Max and obviously GarageBand, AI is running through all that for years now. You can literally, it prompt, that's what I did. A lot of the music that you hear in there, I know music, I know composition. So I know how to speak and prompt language for music. I have to talk to uh, arrangers. I have to talk to musicians. I have to talk to producers. So there's a musical language there, which I'm able to utilize. And the AI has been taught that music, uh, the language. So it actually pulls that back and, and, and does it. So I can take anything that's out there. They already have that built into the digital audio workstation. So there's people now worse than sampling because at least you knew that cool music you learned about. And I thought that's James Brown. Let me go check out James Brown. But now with the digital audio workstation, there's hit records that are being made. You don't even realize that they're not making it at all. The software is 100% made. Yeah. Well, I mean, sorry, sorry, sorry. I'm so I apologize to everybody, really. Um, this is great. The one um, generative AI uh, product, the one class of products that is trained only on public domain work is the music generating. And that's entirely because the music industry is incredibly litigious and super, super powerful. Yeah. So the authors get nothing. Yeah. The painters get nothing. Yeah. The digital artists get nothing. None of us get anything. But the record companies have made sure that open AIs, music generating products, you know, all these different music generating products are trained only on public domain work or are licensed to the gills. Um, and open AI, it's amazing. They will say, the reason we do that is because we have copyright concerns in the same breath that they defend as fair use, what they're doing to visual artists and what they're doing to authors. But so, I, th I, th I think yeah. the, I think the point that also that I hear Sully making um, is perhaps that even if the music generation or even if the dolls are working with stuff that's free and clear in terms of copyright, you're still replacing the drummer, you're still replacing the guitarist, you're still replacing the keyboard player, you're still replacing what would normally take a full band and maybe now can just be done with one person. And, um, and I think that the other point that I heard in the mix, which I think that you both agree on, is that the artist is getting the short end of the stick at the end of the day. Um, but I think that the question I also, also heard Sully asking was, but do audiences care? Uh, ooh, uh, yeah. That's what I was getting. Oh, yes. Do audience, you know, do audiences care? Us as artists care, but, you know, will, I mean, will, will yeah. the people... Again, that's why I say it's a totally different yeah. tool. Yeah. And I agree with Claire, you know, big surprise, shocker, everyone, mm -hmm. that uh, when I find out something is made with generative AI, I'm like... Uh, but that's partly because you're not making anything cool with, I mean, because it doesn't, it's the, it's doing the thing. It's making all the interesting, all the important decisions itself. The results are shitty. So that's not the case with a lot of hip hop, <laughs> you know, like, all right. Well, so I am getting the signal yeah, from Anne of Prelude um, that our time has ended. Um, I'm sure there's opportunities for people to talk to each other on the way out of the room. Um, if you have questions that you might want to ask to a panelist that you didn't get to talk to um, or not, um, people may be running. Um, but. Uh, <laughs> okay, well, I, I think we have to continue in the lobby and we'll turn over the room. Thank you. <laughs>